So we've got our ambient lighting, and we've got our diffuse lighting, and it's all working together with normal mapping. And in this chapter, we're going to go over the third component of the lighting equation, which is the specular lighting. Let me just tell you right off the bat that the, uh, the equation for specular lighting is pretty much a big hack. In, in reality, there's no distinction between diffuse and specular. It's all just reflected light and how reflected light behaves. Um, but when we talk about diffuse dis and specular, it's just kind of a um, convenient way of breaking things up and representing the bounced light uh, in a manageable way um, that has a, region a reasonable cost. Okay, so let's talk about specularity. What we want to do is figure out where our light's coming from and where our I vector is. And based on those two uh, vectors, compute what a reflection of that light source would look like on the surface of our model. And so the first thing that we need to do is bring in the I vector uh, to our pixel shader. Well, let's take a look at that. So we'll scroll up here to the top of our shader. Notice the uh, input and output structs for the output from the pixel shader to the fragment program, we've got an entry here for I vector. So we're going to be calculating the I vector in world space in the vertex shader. And that's what we're doing right here. We're taking the view inverse matrix, uh, the fourth row of the view inverse matrix, and putting it, or creating the I vector in world space. So what this fourth row of the view inverse matrix, and it's the fourth row because we start counting at zero, what this is, is the position of the camera in world space. So if we subtract the world space position of our point on our model from the world space position of our camera, that gives us the I vector, which is a line between the point on our model and the camera. So we've got that in world space, and we pass it out to our pixel shader. Then we come down here in our pixel shader, and we need to actually add the I vector in now as a variable that we can use in the shader. And that's what we're doing right here. So we say float three V, and V means our I vector or our view vector. So we're normalizing that. And now we can come down here to the specular lighting part of our shader and actually use those two bits of information. So the first thing that we're gonna calculate is the half angle. And the half angle is a new vector that we're going to create that's halfway in between the light vector and the view vector. So in order to create the half angle, we're going to say float 3h, and that's the name of our half angle, equals, and we're going to add the light vector together with the view vector. So when we add these two vectors together, we're creating a new vector that's halfway in between the two of them. That's what you get when you add two vectors together. And of course, we need to normalize our vector. To use, we need to use the uh, normalize intrinsic function to make sure that our half angle is also a length of one, just like our other vectors. OK, the next thing that we need to do is take the dot product between our normal and our half angle. And what this is going to do is measure the the angle between our surface normal and our half angle vector. So I'm going to say float n dot h equals dot n and h. So we're going to do a dot product between those two vectors. And then we need to clamp the results between 0 and 1. And an easy way to do that is just to say, saturate dot nh. So we're measuring the angle between these two vectors, and then we're clamping the results uh, between 0 and 1. All right, so now we have a value that's kind of like specular. And let's go ahead and see what we get. So our n dot h is just a single float. Let's see what we get if we make our specular value just n dot h. So I'm just going to paste n dot h into the 3g 
channels of our color here. And we'll hit save and take a look at what happens to our teapot over here. So basically, it just gets blown out. And so we need a way to control the focus of our specular or to control how much of the specular is being applied. And that's where our glossiness comes in. So let's add some code in here that's going to control our glossiness. We're going to say float gloss equals glossiness. And this glossiness that we're taking is one of the variables from our header. If we come up here and, and look at our header, you can see that I've got this glossiness value that can be anywhere from 1 to 512. And that will control the focus of our glossiness. So I'm going to say glossiness times specular texture dot A. And specular texture is the texture that we're looking up in our shader right here, our, our specular map. And we're using the alpha channel of that specular texture to modulate our glossiness. So if we have a glossiness value of 512, for example, but we have an alpha value of 0, we're still going to get 0 glossiness. Um, so we can use the, uh, the alpha channel of our specular texture to control how tight or how broad our specular highlights are. That's, that's kind of a nice feature. OK, so we've got our final gloss value now, and we need to actually use it in the shader. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our n.h and raise it to the power of our glossiness value. Um, first of all, let's just see what happens if we say, let's see, float spec power equals, and what we're going to do is just multiply n.h by itself just to see what happens here. So I'm going to say n.h times n.h, and then I'm going to use this spec power as our result here in our float4 value. And we're just going to see how that looks now. Come over here and look at the teapot. Can you see how the specular got tighter? So what we need to do is actually multiply n.h by itself a whole bunch of times. And the number of times that we're going to do that is actually our glossiness value. And so in order to do that, I need to use the POW intrinsic function. POW! That's kind of like uh, from a Batman cartoon or something. But what this does is the first value uh, raises is the value that we're going to, whoops. The first value is the value that we're going to raise to the power. And then the second value is the number of times that we're going to multiply it by itself. And so we're going to use gloss as the power. So we're multiplying n.h by itself over and over and over uh, the gloss number of times. So we'll hit save here. And now you can see, ooh, hey, look at that. Now we've got specular highlights. That's pretty cool. And what I can do here is bring up the material editor in Max, and I've got my glossiness value set to 256 right now. If I cut this down to maybe like 64, you can notice it updates, and I can control exactly how tight my specular is. So specular highlights are pretty cool. And we've got them working now. And we want to add one more feature to, uh, to give the user a little bit more control over our specular. And so what we're going to do is, instead of saying specular float for spec power, spec power, spec power, we're going to say specular equals spec power times spec color. And spec color is another variable that we've got up here in the header. Uh, let's find it here really quick. So I've got a specular color, and in the material editor, that specular color code defines uh, this color picker here, so I can control the color of the specular highlight. And we're going to add in one more control. So we're going to say, whoops, spec power times spec color 
times, and let me just slide over here really quick. Spec power times spec color times specular texture. And specular texture, of course, is the texture map that we're looking up right here. And what that does is allows us to, in Max, we've got our specular texture slot. So we can have a specular color mask multiplied by our specular color value uh, multiplied by uh, our specular power. So now if we hit save, uh, we'll get a typo. Let's see, where's our problem here? Ah, our variable name is wrong. If we come up here to the header, we can look and see that it's actually specular color instead of spec color. We'll paste that in, save it, and it updates over here in Max. And so there we go. Now I've got our specular highlights. And so just to review, we're calculating our half angle, and then we're finding the dot product between the surface normal and the half angle, and we're clamping that between 0 and 1. Then we're calculating our glossiness by multiplying our specular alpha and our glossiness value. And multiplying by the specular alpha is uh, you know, one of those things that's optional. You don't have to do this, obviously. Um, but it does give you a little bit more control, so that's kind of nice. Then we're raising our n.h dot product by the power of glossiness. And finally, we're calculating our final, final specular color uh, by multiplying our specular power, our specular color, and our specular texture. So you can see that we've put it all together. We've got our ambient, our diffuse, and our specular values. And in the end, we add these three together, ambient plus diffuse plus specular. And that gives us the Blinn lighting model. So there you go. Pretty cool. This lighting model is you know, pretty much the standard in all computer graphics. And of course, there are a lot more advanced techniques that we can do. But we're going to cover some of these these more advanced techniques in the next section of the DVD, things like uh, light attenuation, uh, working with directional lights, uh, spotlights, and things like that. Uh, but for now, you know, this is the, uh, the base lighting model of computer graphics, so you should probably get pretty familiar with how ambient light, diffuse light, and specular lighting work, and just kind of play around with these, and then you'll be ready to move on to the next section of the DVD.